God be all the glory. <laughs> Amen. That was crazy. Amen. Well, I'm in the presence of the men here tonight, right? It's the first meet week of the year, right? So it's time we get a little rowdy, amen? You know, this is our opportunity to let the testosterone all the way out. You know what I'm saying? Let's get wild. But, you know, after, after such an incredible conference, Winter Workshop Conference, at this point, it's the same thing. So much preaching, so much teaching, so much faith breathed in to us as a people. And I'm so excited to be able to build off of that and spark an even greater fire, an even greater furnace here in the Metro Coast men. Let's turn our Bibles over to Numbers 13. Numbers 13. In verse 1, the Bible reads here, The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. For each ancestral tribe sent one of its leaders. So at the Lord's command, Moses sent them out from the desert of Paran. All of them were leaders of the Israelites. These are their names. You know, this is such an incredible moment that we see in history. We see a, a moment that the Israelites have been waiting for for generations, all the way back to Abraham, where God had promised them that he would give them a land of their very own, a land located and known in the history as the crossroads of all the earth where every nation would have to pass through this land. And so the hope would be that the nation of God would rise up and that every nation would come into contact with Jehovah God. And so God's plan was always to reach all nations. And now we see God coming through on his promise. And God says to Moses, send some men in the land. Have them explore the land of Canaan. You know, this is about two to three years after the people of God had come out of Egypt, out of slavery, where they saw incredible miracles. They saw the ten plagues of Egypt. I mean, they really saw God deliver them through the depth of darkness and slavery. They saw God work right before their very eyes. They even saw the Red Sea split. To where they were able to walk on dry ground. Where the situation was very grim. Where you had Egyptian soldiers behind them and water in front of them, which would have been death on both sides, but God made a way. God showed them incredible miracles. And he brought them to this moment where they finally get the opportunity to take the land for God. And I believe we're in a similar moment. I believe we've seen some great things happen. I believe we saw last year truly the year of miracles. We didn't see 10 plagues. We saw 517 miracles all last year. We saw God do great things. But have we taken the promised land? Not at all. We've got so much work to be done. I pray that the Winter Workshop was not simply an emotional high for you. I pray that it was a spark to an incredible furnace of faith still burning in your heart and burning in your campuses, burning in your workplaces, and burning here at Men's Midweek. You know, it goes on after this in verse 17. He begins to give them certain instructions. He says, go and see how the land is. Tell me if it's good. Are the people weak or strong? Are there few or many? What kind of land is it? What's the soil like? Are, they, are the cities walled and fortified? And he says, do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. I want to see how fertile it really is. Is it really the land flowing with milk and honey? We read here in verse 21. It says, so they went up 
and explored the land of the desert of Zin as far as Rehob toward Lobo, Hamath. They went through the Negev and came to Hebron, where Ahimon, Shishai, Telmai, the descendants of Anak lived. Hebron had been built seven years before Zon in Egypt. When they reached the valley of Eshcol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them, along with some pomegranates and figs. That place was called the Valley of Eshcol because of the single cluster of grapes cut off there. At the end of the 40 days, they return exploring the land. You know, here, as they venture into the land, this would have been the leaders of thousands, most likely, as it would have represented all the 12 tribes of Israel. And as they enter this land, they see the great conquest that God has put before them. And they say, if we're going to take the land, I mean, we got through Egypt, we got through the Red Sea, but it's time to take the promised land. And if we're going to get through and take the land that God has promised us, it's going to take a conquering faith. And that's the title of my lesson, A Conquering Faith. My brothers, if we're going to do the great things that I believe God has put before us here in the Metro Coast, in the West, and in the Southland, it's going to take us to go to the next level. See, it's time for us to take our faith from just being early converts to now conquering converts for Christ. We've got to take off from here spiritually. Where we're not looking to do some good things. We're looking to change the course of history for all time. I believe this moment we're in is a moment we will never forget. We will never forget this time that we're in. You know why? Because by, the, by this time next year, we're going to be reflecting about how God did even more in 2024. But it's going to be on us to have a conquering faith. You know, here, they go into the land, and it says that they, they see how awesome the land really is. Moses says, bring back fruit, and they bring back, it says, an eshkol of fruit. You ever use this word? No. No. You did it. But it says an eshkol. In other translations, it's like a cluster or a mound. I mean, when they bring back some fruit, they bring back a ton of fruit. And when we headed into 2024, we brought in a ton of fruit, showing us that the land is ready to be harvested. Showing us that the land is waiting for us to just go and work super hard for God. It says here that they had to carry it between two men. I mean, isn't it just awesome starting our campus campaigns? Isn't it? I mean, is it awesome to start our campus campaigns? I mean, it's incredible. The amount of Bible studies that are, coming, that are coming through the pipeline right now. I mean, right now at UCLA alone, we got about 80 Bible studies going on. 80 Bible studies. And we haven't even seen the real heat from LMU and SMC just yet. And I know, I know Southland is still kicking here and got about 80 studies over there too. And we haven't even seen DH or USC open up yet. I mean, is the land ready to be harvested? Can't you just feel the fruit coming our way? Can't you just feel the miracles that God is going to do? I believe if we underestimate the daunting task we have of building the great church here in the Metro Coast and for L.A. for that matter, we will miss what Satan is going to try to throw at us right now. This is an opportune time for us to do something great for God. But at the same moment it's an opportune time for us to do something great for God, it's also an opportune time for Satan to attack. And I believe we're going to talk about having a conquering faith, but I'd like to do a little bit something I learned from my pops, you know. you got to talk about the inverse. So when you want to talk about conquering faith, let's just talk about what it looks like to not have a conquering faith. And so we're going to look at a people that did not have the faith to conquer. It says here that he sends them out and they come back after 40 days. My first point for you is, Embrace the testing of your faith. You know, I was super inspired by Joey's charge at the men's track for, uh, for that Saturday session. And he talked about receiving the blessing through the testing. And it was incredible because when you gain that level of perspective, it gives you confidence knowing what you're going into. And right now, in a great way, I I'm very excited for this year. I'm thrilled to see this room multiply, for us to fill up the pews. 
But I'm not going to underestimate the power of the dark forces in this time. See, right when we're ready to strike, so is Satan. What's the best time to get a group to just stifle spiritually? You hit them right out the gates. And you hit them with major blows. Super sad to hear so many of our family members and different people getting sick and seeing family members pass on like Raul and Linda's uh, sister. I mean, it, it's, it's such a, a, an incredible dark moment. A sobering thing. Right out the gates. I mean, on New Year's, I got a call from my dad that he's in jail for nine months. My dad's 62 years old. Drug addict. I mean, it's, it's a bad situation. And for me, I'm like, this is, I was, I was, I'm like, I'm fired up. Man, that's a hit. And so if we don't take this moment right now and really put your Kevlar on, and we're not expecting things to just go smoothly, we have to expect chaos. We have to expect things to get wild. We have to expect things to get crazy. You're going to study the Bible with people, and they're going to fall off at count the cost. You're going to baptize somebody, and sadly, yes, they're just going to walk right away, thanking you and just walking right back into the darkness. It's going to happen. But we've got to embrace the testing of our faith. You know, here it says that Moses sent them out to explore the land. You got to think, Moses said and gave them a, a criteria of questions to really ponder while they're in there for 40 days. But did God not know what was in the land of Canaan beforehand? So what was the purpose of sending these people out and getting them to report back? It wasn't for God's security. It wasn't for his questioning or confusion. It was to test their faith. It even says it comes after 40 days if you study the, the, the numerology of 40, you see that it's commonly used as a time of trial, a time of testing. You see, what he was giving them an opportunity to do was to survey if they had, to fa if it, if they had the faith to conquer for God. If they believed that in spite of what they saw, despite everything that they see, no matter the circumstances or the conditions, that God said what he said, and my God stands on business. And so for us to understand that... He says, go out and see for 40 days. And it's the opportunity for you to test your faith. You know, we see why he sends them out here. Well, if you look over here at Exodus 13, it says in verse 17, it says, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. So we see why God does not send them to the land of Canaan immediately upon leaving Egypt. Because they were not ready for war. God saw the condition of this slave nation. He says, you, you got a pick fork and you got like a little, you know, a little, maybe some farming tools. But you ain't got no swords and you're definitely not prepared for battle. You've been probably malnourished a bit while you're in Egypt in slavery, beaten, not ready to really face war. And so he doesn't send them out. Now we see in Numbers 13, he says, now's the time. You've been in the desert for a little bit. Now it's time to send you into the land of Canaan. And maybe that was your last year. Maybe you were held in safe country for a little bit. But let me tell you, 2024, there is no safe zone. There is no comfort zone anymore in 2024. It's not allowed anymore. Everybody's got to get out of their comfort zone. Everybody's got to push. Everybody's got to embrace this testing of their faith. Because let me let you know. Let, let me let you know that the tests are coming. So you might as well embrace it. You know, God wanted to ask them a question. Did you believe? Will you believe in me despite what you see? Will you believe in me despite how you feel? Will you believe in my word? Will you hold on to the anchor for your soul despite what's going on around you? How should we endure this time of testing of our faith? Well, let's go look at James chapter 2. James chapter 2. James chapter 1, I'm sorry, in verse 2.
James chapter, James chapter 1 and verse 2, it says here, Consider it pure joy. Stop, stop, stop. Real quick. Let's address that. Let's talk about that really quick. Go ahead and text your leader right now and get open. And just tell them you haven't been doing this right, right, right here. But it says here. It says consider pure joy. When? Let's just find out what he's talking about. Don't assume. Don't assume. Don't do that. Mother of all mistakes. It says my brothers. So he's talking to the men here. And I'm talking to the men of the Metro Coast right now. Amen. Whenever. So it doesn't matter winter time, summertime, springtime, or this time. It just says whenever. The Greek of that means whenever. And I was studying out other translations in the KJV. It also translates to whenever. And then when I read it in the um, Gen Z Bible, it also says whenever. So I just, I just want to make sure we're all in the same, but we're all good though, right? Awesome. Let's keep reading. It says, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. You know, it's incredibly powerful, the passage of Scripture we see here in James chapter 1, as we understand that he's writing to a predominantly Jewish audience. This, sort of, this book was written in about 40 to 45 A.D., which was definitely pre-Gentile membership, as we know in Acts 10, that we see Cornelius was the first Gentile added into the kingdom. But we see here, he says, consider it pure joy. So when you think about, when you ponder how many battles you will face, Consider it pure joy. He says, because you know. The Bible assumes that you would know what testing is for. You see, the thing we have to understand is your faith is a theory until proven genuine. You may say, I believe that Jesus is Lord. This life is a test to see if you're a liar. Deuteronomy 8.2 says you were sent to see if what was really in your heart. And every year you will be tested and refined. So you might as well embrace the testing of your faith. It says here you know. The reason why it says that is because their history would have been the people back in Numbers 13. It would have been the people, it would have been the people of God. It would have been Abraham, Moses. He understands that they got your, your faith must be tested. It must be tried to ensure that you are tried and true. He goes on and says, your faith will develop perseverance. That testing will develop perseverance. And it must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. You know, I believe as Americans, this is one of the most hated scriptures. You know why? Because when we do something good, you know what we expect? A reward. We're in the great participation award generation. That because you decided to show up, that you deserve something in return. When we do really well, we want somebody to congratulate us. We want somebody to pat us on the back. We want, you know what we want? We want things to get easier. But the Bible says that when you do well, hey, you're going to face trials. You know what you get for doing well? You get a test. You get a test. Sometimes the victory is the test. See, we had an incredible year of miracles. But maybe that was the acid test to see if you really had faith in the miracle worker or you had faith in just the miracles alone. That the miracles are what kept me going. And it wasn't the Messiah. You see, we have a question to answer as we endure these coming trials in this year 2024. You see, if we understand the year of blessings, well, if you understand Genesis 32, Jacob had to wrestle for the blessing. He had to get tested to see how bad he really wanted the blessing. So if we want to have an incredible year of blessings, how much are you willing to embrace the wrestling for the blessing? You may be thinking, why is, 
Why are things going to be so hard? Why do things have to be hard all the time? I killed it last year. I should, man, Metro Coast, we had almost 100 baptisms. I mean, we should be getting a reward for that. We should be getting a pat on the back. Satan should be relaxing. Satan should chill. Let me tell you something. Satan is absolutely irate. He's ticked. And he is ready to let off that leash and attack what we've built here and what we're continuing to build in the Metro Coast. But I hope and I pray and I believe that when Satan decides to put his rear ugly head in our face, that we're going to turn back, look at God and say, we got this. And we're going to embrace the testing of our faith. Now, how do you embrace the testing of your faith? How do you embrace this? Well, one, you have to gain perspective. You have to understand why testing is necessary. See, Hebrews 12 actually teaches you have to endure all hardship as discipline from God. He's treating you as a son. He says if you're not disciplined, then you're an illegitimate child. Like, let me ask you a question. How many of us want to be legit? So, so, okay, you're too legit to quit. Let me just, let me just, let me just tell you what that means now. You're asking to be disciplined, to be proven legit. But here's the, here's the caveat to that. Here's the encouragement. You can confirm you're a son when you're disciplined as one. When you endure hardship as dis, you're like, man, you don't look at hardships as like a time to fall apart. Oh, my Bible talk, everything's happening, and I don't know what to do. You're like, God's teaching me something. You know what's awesome? When you have this heart, everything is God teaching you something. I got removed from this position. Wow, I mean, I'm grateful God is protecting me from what would have been an impending. Maybe that was the route where I may have fallen away. Man, I didn't date last year, man. I was, you know what I'm saying? Like, I baptized like three, four people, and they ain't give me no girlfriend. I ain't getting no girlfriend. Man. Man, why they tripping? They tripping. But instead, you look at it as like, God's got the perfect sister brewing for me. Brewing for me. I got you, dog. I got you. (laughs) That was for you. (laughs) But I think this, this understanding of what hardship and discipline is in your life, it brings clarity. And you know what clarity brings? Confidence. When you know where you're going, your steps are firm. You're determined and you have an unwavering focus that you're going to be determined to please God even in the midst where things are not all the way ideal. That it may get crazy, but as long as God doesn't change, my convictions don't change, and my attitude don't change, I'm going to keep my head in all situations. you got to embrace the testing of your faith. But how do you become a conqueror unless you, con- you have a great conquest that you're on? The conqueror is built by the conquest. See, many of us want to be conquerors for God, but you don't want to have to endure anything to do so. No great sailor was made by calm seas. And so you get to make the decision. Either you're going to allow this hardship to train you, or you're going to allow this hardship to discourage you. It doesn't say the certain types of hardship you'll face. It says all hardships you consider pure joy. You've got to look for God through the darkness. And in that moment, you got to fix your eyes on Jesus. Because let me tell you, he's in the midst of that hardship. And he just wants to see, are you going to focus on what's around you? Or are you going to focus on me above you? Because I never change. I'm always here. I never went anywhere. Just embrace this test and you'll be proven genuine. Amen. It goes on here. Because what could happen as a temptation? To embrace this testing of your faith. Verse 13, it says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desires he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above. 
coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might not be a kind of first fruits of all he created. You know, it's awesome because it, it then goes on to teach and it, it levels with you. It's like, hey, just to let you know, just to get out in front of this common mistake that's made. When you're starting to go through trials, what's the natural human inclination? You start blaming God. You're like, God, you did this. Why are you putting me here? God's like, no, no, no. That's the product of your decisions, brother. That's where you put yourself. I didn't tell you to get into that sin. I cannot be tempted by evil. You're the one who chose to give into that. Your circumstances are a product of your decisions, not a bunch of random happenings. Nobody has the power to decide but you. Doesn't matter how convinced you are. He goes on and he says, don't be deceived. Every good and perfect gift is from above. You know, I think that when we start facing trials, we have to understand that there is a faithful way to endure these trials. When you're going through hardship, there's a faithful way. It's not, a, it's not like, like, things is not the end of the world. I think as men, we got to get away from just, like, just, just complaining. Like, why, woe is me? Like, why, why is this like this? When these trials come, don't say, why me? Say, try me. Whoa. Say, try me. I'm ready to be tried and true. Because you know why? God wants you to shine bright like a diamond. You know what diamond's value is determined by? The cut. So how much are you willing to be cut in order to determine your value? The willingness to cut you is always on the end. God's end, he's like, I value you. I want to cut you up until you're made perfect into the perfect image of God. But your willingness to allow that determines how much you see your value in the eyes of God. So if you're unwilling to endure and persevere righteously and faithfully, it just shows you don't value yourself the way God does. You don't see yourself the way God sees you. God wants you to shine bright, but who's going to embrace the testing and the cutting of the trials? You know, he then goes on and he says, we're a kind of first fruits of all God created. See, he's speaking to the early converts of the Jerusalem church. So he's trying to help them to understand why you're facing these many trials. It's because the movement that God was building within the first century had to be built up on strong shoulders. Where would the teachers, where would the leaders of thousands come from other than the first century church there in Acts chapter 2 in 29 AD? The prototype church. He was looking at the early leaders and saying, you have to look at yourself as the man that you will be in 10 years. God is investing in that man now. But do you see what God sees? When I look at this group, I'm not looking at just the metro coast. I'm looking at the future leaders of thousands. That's what I see. But what do you see? Where is your faith at? Because when you believe that, you'll train like that. You'll endure like that. You know what an athlete says when the coach pushes them? They don't say, why are you doing this to me, coach? They understand one simple thing. That coach has a job. Push you to your limit and expect the most out of you. How do I know if you're going to quit unless I test and see if you're going to quit? This time of testing, we are running into. We're not walking and being dragged into. We're forcefully finding our way through the trials. Are you with me here? You know, it goes on after that, and it begins to talk about listening and doing in the book of James. And I think the thing we have to understand is he, he then says, do not merely listen to the word, but so, and so deceive yourself, do what it says. You know, I have a question because we had... A ton of baptisms. We saw an incredible amount of miracles last year. But like Ole preached for the Bible Talk Leaders track, not everybody participated in those miracles. Not everybody's hands were on the plow for all those miracles. Can you imagine if everybody's hands were on the plow? You know, this group, no, no, this group calls itself all disciples. But the Bible says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. So the question is, what are you doing with your discipleship? It's not what you agree with. It's what you're doing. The proof is in the pudding. Some of us wonder why we're struggling and why we're having a little bit of a lethargic moment. It's because you're not doing anything. 
You're stagnant. You're not moving. Let that be left in 2023. Again, I'm going to keep saying it. Let us say no more in 2024. Let that stay behind. Let that be left in the past and let you become the man that God wants you to be. John 8, it says, if you hold to my teachings, what teachings are you holding to? What teachings? At what level? The level of being a disciple of Jesus. My Bible says that the, a disciple makes a disciple. How do you prove that you're a disciple? You bear much fruit. Last year, how many of us were in the battle? That's okay. Philippians teaches us, forget what is behind, strain towards what is ahead. It's time to have a conquering faith. Embrace those trials. Learn from what you did. Pick yourself back up because you can't get back up unless you fall. So maybe you fell, but now it's time the opportunity to get back up. It's time for you to put your hand to the plow and for us to embrace the testing of our faith. I got out of hand. Let's go back to Numbers, 20, uh, Numbers 13. Got a little wild. Sorry about that. Numbers 13 and verse 26 reads here. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and their cities are fortified and very large. We even saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with them said, we can't attack those people, for they are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw were of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anna came from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. My second point, faithlessness butts out faith. You know, here, we understand and we learn from this passage of Scripture that fear and faithlessness doesn't grow unless you feed it. Because as they have the opportunity to stoke the fire and the flames of the word of God, they chose to stoke the furnace of fear. You see, faithlessness is something that will completely stop you spiritually. You see, they become so duplicit even in their thinking. They're trying to reconcile the word of God. But, they say but twice. They say the land is flowing with milk and honey, but we can't. This is, you know, we can do it. You know, I know what God said, but... But faithlessness butts out faith. You see, your response to conquering for God should never be ended with a but. Man, we're going to have an incredible year, but it should never be that way. Circumstances will either make you a Caleb or a coward. You see here? There was one faithless man, two faithless men we understand from Joshua 14. But Joshua and Caleb were the only two spies that brought back a faithful report. The, all the rest cowered in fear because they did not really have the anchor of God's word in their hearts. See, Caleb, when he hears this, he doesn't succumb to the faithlessness of the majority. He sticks with the minority. He says, you know what? I don't care what people say. I don't care what is being said by the persecutors. I don't care what's being said from those within or without. God said it. That's the end of the argument. We're done. I'm not talking about it anymore. I ended the argument at God's word. I knew I was taking the land before I walked in the land. And I wasn't asking for it. I expected to take it just like God said we would. Circumstances will either make you a Caleb or a coward. You get to decide. But what are some products of faithlessness? We learn in chapter 14, verse 1, it says, the all, the night, That night, all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. What is the first sign of somebody who's succumbed to faithlessness? You begin to whine. 
and you sound like a five-year-old child whining because things are just not the way you wanted them to be. Your faithlessness in butting out your faith. Don't allow that whining and complaining to enter into your life. No grown man, not a man that is a real man, should ever find itself walking into his household and just whining about his circumstances. You have to take ownership and say, I am the problem and I am the solution. I will not complain and fold under the pressures of life. I'm going to conquer the pressures of life. What's the second one? Verse 2, it says, All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in the desert. I mean, it just gets bad when you allow faithlessness to really get in there. What's the second thing? You just start to complain. Everything becomes too much for you. You can't handle different calls in the ministry, the different changes and different trends, whatever happens. You're just like, well, well why do we have to do that? Why, why, that doesn't make sense. Dang it, man, I just, I wish we could do it this way. Why do we have to do a pledge drive right out of the year? Why do we have to do missions right now by the end of February? I mean, you know I just went through Christmas. What the heck? And you just start to complain. Now's not the time. Now's not the time. If you wanted to do that, you should have did that on December 31st. Because now we're in January. Now we're in January. It's, the, it's a new year. It's 2024. We don't complain no more in 2024. Christianity becomes this big drag all the time when you allow faithlessness in your heart. I don't look at the Bible and see it's a big drag. I see that Christianity is awesome. I mean, look at Paul's life. I mean, he went through so many trials and tests. You look at David. You look at Moses. I mean, these guys had great lives. They weren't down and discouraged. They were conquerors ready to do great things for God. Why? Because they didn't let the faithlessness butt out their faith. They held on strong to the word of God. We've got to stop describing faith as a feeling. Faith is not a feeling. Do you think I feel faithful all the time? That's enough. You've got to look at a passage like this and just say, ah, oh, No, no, no. Let's, let's give an example. How does this look? You're on campus. You're sharing your faith. You see, the, you see, you see this girl. Like, you see the situation. You're like, oh, no, no, no. Absolutely not. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. I got too much to do. I want to honor God way too much. I got a lot on my heart. I got a schedule. I got Bible studies. I ain't got time to be looking over there and seeing that situation. I'm going to look up here and focus on this situation. It's time now. Right now. No. It can't happen to the Metro Coast. Not here. We've got to be the men that say, you know what? I'm not going to allow fear and faithlessness to enter my heart. I have too many verses where I can combat any amount of faithlessness. The Bible says 2 Corinthians 10, 5, take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. You have a stupid thought, we'll join the party. Everybody got stupid thoughts all the time. You need to stop crying. It's time to be real men. Real men that are not looking to ask for things. We came to take the land for God. You know, I think that the reason why I preach this so hard is because I reflected on my last year. You know what I saw? I saw too many moments where I gave into faithlessness. Where I just didn't believe all that God could do. I allowed my faith to be limited by the circumstance. I refuse to be faithless. Man, I 
reflected, I, I was thinking about, I was like, God, I'm sure God looks down and he's like, man, I could do more through you. I could do more. I could do more if I just decided to believe in you more. I, I just decided to believe. You know what the difference was? The difference in buts. There is a but you should have. But the only but you should have is from Joshua 14. Where he says, you yourself heard, you yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified, but the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. There's only one but, and that comes after you decide what the circumstances are. Yes, our campuses are big and they may have kicked us off USC, but with the Lord helping me, we will take that campus. Yes, I saw my away but I'm still gonna stay faithful yes I'm gonna study the Bible with a lot of people watch them walk away but I'm still gonna study the Bible with people but all that you got to look at the circumstances say but God every time assess what they are Abraham faced the facts but then he understood that God was still real you know what the difference between Joshua and Caleb was and all the other men Hebrews 6, 13 to 20, you can write that down. I ain't got time to go to it. But it says that in order for us to understand how anchored the promises and words of God are, what does God do? He doesn't swear by a man. He says there was no one greater to swear by, by than promise for. So he swore by himself. And it says he ends the argument. You ever had that where you're talking? And then somebody's like, no, I swear on my life that this is a situation. That right there shuts you up a little bit. Like, oh, he might be serious. This is real deal. Well, God, when it comes to every promise in his word, he looks at it and he says, this is not on anybody's life but my existence. God swore by himself. And the Bible says that it is impossible for God to lie. I need every man in this, in this, in this pews right now. When you have your quiet time, it is not time to contemplate if it's true. The way you need to look at the lens of the Bible is through one lens. So when God says he wants the whole land, it's impossible for God to lie. When God says you're going to bear much fruit showing yourself to be a disciple, it's impossible for God to lie. When God says you will go from strength to strength, it is impossible for God to lie. When God says we're going to take the whole metro coast, it is impossible for God to lie. Are you with me here, brother? These people even lose touch with reality. They even say in the verses preceding, it says the land of ours, the people living in the land. That doesn't even make sense. The people living there can't be devoured by the people living. That just it doesn't even make sense. And that's how you sound when you're faithless. You don't make any sense at all. It just doesn't compute. It's not logic. It's not the real world. It's a world without God. All of us have to go to those atheistic parts of our brains and our hearts and take a stand and say, this is for God now. Every one of us has them. You need to decide to conquer those parts of your heart and your mind. Let that stuff go. It's not real. It's not true. Either God's a liar or you are. You choose. Either God's word will be true, just like his nature is to give and to love and to create. His nature is to tell the truth. It's time for us to decide that we're going to believe the words of God and let them be true. Not our emotions, not our circumstances, not the faithlessness that's surrounding us. There are people right now that want us to fail. Man, I feel like DJ Khaled. They didn't believe in us. (laughs) Nah, like like it's people, it's humans that didn't believe in us. Shame on them. But God did. (laughs) But God did. And man, guys, there may be opposition on every side. But let me tell you, don't look at the 10,000 reasons why you can't. You just need the one reason why you can. And that's because God does believe in us. Are you with me? You know, the reason why. The Israelites did not enter the promised land. It says in Hebrews 4 and verse verse 5, it says they didn't enter because of their unbelief. They didn't combine the message of God that they would take the land, and they didn't combine it with faith. 
You have an opportunity tonight to combine the message of conquering faith, and you can combine that message with faith. But it's all determined by your decision. I want to read a scripture to you and tell you who you are as men, how God sees you. And I don't want you questioning. I want you to take God at his word and combine it with faith. Or we too will be in the same position that the Israelites were in. Let's turn over to Romans 8. Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, in verse 31, the title of this passage is More Than Conquerors. It says in verse 31, what then shall we say in response to this? So what should you respond to this lesson with? He says, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, Gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is that condemns? Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life. Is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now combine that message with faith. And stop questioning the creator. And decide to believe the message. The Bible depicts you as more than conquerors. God stamps that by even saying, he says, who did not spare his own son's life to give us the identity that we now have? Do you realize how crazy God is about us? He doesn't need us at all. But he's chosen you because he wants you. He wants to use you. Let us not allow this to become the parable of the tenants. Where God rips the kingdom away from us and gives us the people that will produce its fruit. And all because you just chose not to see yourself the way God sees you. And not believe in the words of God. See, he says that God's so crazy about us that he killed his son for you. He's willing to go that far. There's no distance, no height, nor depth. Now, if that's the length at which he was willing to go, his love will never be separated from you. His identity that he's put up on you will never be taken from you. See, my brothers, we have a decision right now to become the men that God is calling us to be. We still have new lands to get to here in Metro Coast. And I pray you feel prepared right now and expecting the chaos to come, that you embrace the testing of your faith, and that when those opportunities to be faithless, you just snuff those out and choose faith. Don't let the faithlessness butt out your faith. But after every challenge you lay out, you should say, but there's God. But if we're going to persevere, if we're going to multiply this fruit, if we're going to do even greater things and see 500 more baptisms in the L.A. church, it's going to take all of us as men to decide to have a conquering faith and to God be all the glory.